The Columbian Institute for the Promotion of Arts and Sciences (1816–1838) was a literary and science institution in Washington, D.C., founded by Dr. Edward Cutbush (1772–1843), a naval surgeon. Thomas Law had earlier suggested of such a society at the seat of government. It was the first learned society established in Washington and was organized on June 28, 1816, 16 years after the city was occupied, and less than two years after the invasion by the British troops. The second article of its constitution states, the institute shall consist of mathematical, physical, moral and political sciences, general literature and fine arts. History It is believed that the formation of the Columbian Institute was a product of the idealism and dreams of the early leaders in Washington, including Presidents George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and John Quincy Adams, who envisioned the city as a "...cultural capital spreading enlightenment to the nation by roads, canals, and rivers." The true origin of the Columbian Institute began on June 15, 1816, with the formation of an association called the Metropolitan Society. The group, totaling 89 residents of the city of Washington, signed a plan to create a living museum of sorts containing specimens of grains, grasses, fruits, dye stuffs, medicinal plants, and minerals. The group was impressed with the importance of collecting and distributing various vegetable productions of not only America, but other countries. They had an idea to apply to Congress for the appropriation of about 200 acres of ground, called the Mall, which was designed in the original plan of the city for a public garden. They also planned to cultivate and plant the seeds and as they multiplied, to distribute them throughout the country and world. The original subscribers of the Metropolitan Society included Samuel Harrison Smith, Thomas Law, Dr. Alexander McWilliams, Dr. Andrew Hunter, and Dr. Edward Cutbush. The members framed a constitution, the draft of which was submitted and unanimously agreed to on August 8, 1816. At that time, the name was changed to the Columbian Institute for the Promotion of Arts and Sciences. Chartered The Society was chartered by Congress 20 months later on April 20, 1818, during the first session of the 15th Congress for a term of 20 years. Edward Cutbush was the first president of the institution, however, by 1825, John Quincy Adams held that title. At the time the society was formed, the population in Washington was a little more than 10,000 citizens and the construction of the public buildings was still in the initial stage. The wording of the charter follows that the said corporation, by purchase or otherwise, a suitable building for the sittings of the said institution, and for the preservation and safe keeping of a library and museum, and, also, a tract or parcel of land, for a botanic garden, not exceeding five acres, provided, that the amount of real and personal property to be held by the said corporation shall not exceed $100,000. The first four years, the focus of the institution was wholly of a utilitarian nature, such as government has from time to time assumed and made the basis of work of several scientific bureaus. Four years later, by 1826, however, an organization was adopted which gave to the institute the latitude of a comprehensive learned society. Topic: <laughs> Scientific work for the United States. Among all the activities planned, only a few in any way conspicuously carried out, in default of the necessary support, the most important and material of these being the establishment of a botanic garden and a museum. Meetings were held in a variety of temporary offices, including a committee room in the Capitol Building that Congress granted use of on December 20, 1828. Although the membership roster of the institution included many distinguished citizens and several presidents, they were unable to raise money for the greenhouse and lecture hall required for the garden and museum. The advice of the institute was sought and obtained in the matter of formulating instructions for the scientific work. 
of the United States exploring expedition that took place from 1828 to 1842. Advice was also requested in the preparation of a national pharmacopoeia. The society also became closely associated, mainly through two of its prominent members, William Lambert and William Elliott, with the problems of determining the meridian of Washington, of establishing a national astronomical observatory, and of fixing upon a system of weights and measures. Topic: <laughs> Museum The museum started with a cabinet of minerals which remained predominant in the collection and soon developed into a small museum containing specimens of zoology, botany, ethnology, archaeology, fossils, etc. It was transferred to the National Institute for the Promotion of Science in 1841. By 1918, some of the original collection were readily distinguishable in the United States National Museum, now known as the Smithsonian Institution. The Institute obtained its meeting places and accommodations for the museum, "...mainly through the favor successively of the executive departments, the municipal government and Congress." The museum was first located in Blodgett's Hotel, containing the General Post Office and the Patent Office, followed by the Treasury Department and the City Hall. A permanent home was finally assigned in 1824 in the western edition of the Capitol Building, which had recently been completed. Botanic Garden One of the greatest accomplishments of the Society was the creation of a botanic garden in 1821. The tract, which was swamp land, was situated a mere 80 feet from the steps of the Capitol building. The land was located between 1st and 3rd Streets and Pennsylvania and Maryland Avenues on the west side of the Capitol building. By the end of 1823 the tract of land granted by Congress had been drained and leveled, an elliptical pond with an island at its center constructed, and four graveled walks laid out. Trees and shrubs were planted, and the garden was maintained as well as scanty funds would permit until the Institute expired in 1837, one year before the termination of its charter. On May 26, 1824, the grounds were extended and in 1825, they were enclosed. There seems to be no record of what improvements or plantings were made by the Columbian Institute. The Institute had expended $1,500 on the grounds for walks and plantings and had asked Congress to be reimbursed, but this request was not granted. The Institute quickly launched an enthusiastic effort to collect plants and seeds. In 1826, a committee was appointed to meet with heads of government departments to help solicit all subjects of natural history that may be deemed interesting from foreign representatives. The following year, Secretary of the Treasury, Richard Rush, was also involved in the solicitation by circulating a letter to foreign dignitaries. Quote, in the letter he stated that President John Quincy Adams was desirous of causing to be introduced into the United States all such trees and plants from other countries not heretofore known in the United States, as may give promise, under proper cultivation, of flourishing and becoming useful. The publicity was extremely successful. Plants and seeds made their way to the Institute from as far away as China and Brazil. Some came from areas nearby, such as Montgomery County in Maryland. In 1824, a list of plants in the Botanic Garden of the Columbian Institute was prepared by William Elliott. The pamphlet mentioned more than 458 plants growing at that time. Sixteen years passed, and by 1836, no further improvements had been made on the property. Quote, the tract was a stagnant and malarial swamp, and Congress was prevailed upon to make an appropriation of $5,000 for improvements. Quote, the funds were used to drain the site and erect a fountain, financial woes continued to plague the Institute, and there was never enough money from contributions for proper maintenance of the garden and plant collections. The facility ceased to operate in 1837 when the Society stopped holding meetings. 
However it was reinstituted in 1842 when the Wilkes expedition of the South Seas brought back a collection of plants. In 1850, 13 years after the demise of the Columbian Institute, the garden was reopened as the United States Botanical Garden. The garden had begun as 5 acres, 20,000 square meters of swamp land and had gradually expanded to 13 acres, 53,000 square meters. Topic: Institute loses charter. There was only one meeting held in 1837. The minutes indicate no unusual action took place, but it proved to be the last. The institute virtually dissolved without formality", the year before the termination of its charter. The records show only 85 communications by 26 people presented during the entire life of the society, over one half of which related to astronomy and mathematics. It appears, largely, that a lack of funds prevented the publication of transactions of the Institute, which would have gone far toward perpetuating the name of the society. However unfortunate in the realization of its ambitions, the Columbian Institute nevertheless occupied an enviable position among the earlier associations of this country for the breadth and importance of its objects. The Columbian Institute's charter expired in 1838 and, in 1841, it was absorbed by the National Institute for the Promotion of Science. The Institute's founders had hoped that this group would become the Washington counterpart to Philadelphia's American Philosophical Society, but as early as 1826, the Institute was dying, and along with it the Botanical Garden, it has been discussed that, "...early efforts provided little ground for optimism," because the federal scientific agencies of the "...early republic," did not owe their existence to "...any commitment to science as such." William Stanton has observed that until the 1840s, Washingtonians had founded a dreary train of institutions." It can be argued, however, that the institution received very little funding from the federal government and it was in default of the necessary support. Members <inaudible> 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 Under the original constitution of the society written in 1816 only two classes of members were recognized, resident and honorary, however in 1820 a corresponding member was added. Additionally, a position was provided for the President of the United States so that, with his permission, he could "...be considered the patron of the Columbian Institute." James Monroe, who was president at the time, was the only president who ever accepted the title. It appears about 150 persons qualified for the institution as residents of Washington. Not over one half that number were ever in good standing at any time, the proportion being generally smaller and the total number becoming greatly reduced during the final years. The total number elected to corresponding membership was 122 and honorary membership, total of seven. Quote, the resident membership was representative of the best element in Washington, while the corresponding and honorary memberships included some of the best known men in science, literature, and the arts, both in this country and abroad. The honorary members included three presidents who were still alive during the 1820s John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison, as well as Marquis Lafayette and Baron Cuvier. However, John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson were both resident members. The membership of the Institute included many prominent men of the day, including well-known representatives of the military, government service, medical, law and other professions. At least eleven of the men held the office of Mayor of Washington. John Quincy Adams 1767 resident member, 6th President of the United States. Joseph Anderson 1757 first Controller of the United States Treasury. James Barber, 1775 to 1842, 18th Governor of Virginia, served as Secretary of War. William T. Barry, 1784 to 1835, Kentucky House of Representatives, served as Postmaster General. Simon Bernard, 1779 to 1839, French General of Engineers, US Army Chief of Engineers. John M. Berrien (1781–1856), Georgia Senator, served as Attorney General. Rev. 
Andrew Bigelow, Minister. James H. Blake, M.D. (1763–1819), practicing physician, third mayor of Washington, D.C. John Bomford, Call, Chief of the Ordnance Bureau. B. S. Borer, M.D., physician. Phineas Bradley, assistant postmaster general, banker. William A. Bradley, D.1867, banker, former mayor of Washington, D.C. Robert Brent, 1763 to 1819, banker, judge of Orphans Court, first mayor of Washington, D.C. William Brent, 1784 to 1848, U.S. representative for Louisiana. J. A. Brereton, M.D., physician. Reverend Obadiah B. Brown, 1779 to 1852, minister. Charles Bullfinch (1763–1844), architect, designed the U.S. Capitol building. Elias B. Caldwell, clerk of the Supreme Court. John C. Calhoun (1782–1850), Secretary of War, seventh Vice President of the United States. Reverend John N. Campbell (1798–1864), minister. Thomas Carberry, 1791 to 1863, sixth mayor of Washington D.C. Overton Carr, banker, one of the original land holders in the Federal District. William T. Carroll, educator, professor. Daniel Carroll, 1730 to 1796, banker from Duddington, politician and one of the founding fathers of the United States. Nathaniel P. Cousin (1761–1827), Judge of the Orphans' Court. Rev. Ira Chase, Minister. Matthew St. Clair Clark (1790–1852), Clerk of the United States House of Representatives. Henry Clay (1777–1852), served as Secretary of State from 1825 to 1829. John Coyle Jr., Secretary of the Howard Society. William Cranch, 1769 to 1855, Chief Justice of the Circuit Court. William H. Crawford, 1772 to 1834, served as Secretary of War and Treasury, candidate for president in 1824. Edward Cutbush, MD, 1772 to 1843, naval surgeon and founder of the Columbian Institution and Geneva Medical College. Nathaniel Cutting, civilian, unknown. Asbury Dickens, 1817 to 1838, chief clerk of the Treasury Department and secretary of the United States Senate. Served as secretary of the Institute from 1818 to 1838. Malin Dickerson (1770–1853), Governor of New Jersey, served as Secretary of the Navy. William Elliott, Clerk in the Patent Office. Jonathan Elliott, Historian (1784–1846), Writer, Publisher, or Editor. Samuel Elliott Jr., Vice President of the Washington Botanical Society. Philip Richard Fendel (1794–1868), Banker, Lawyer, and Editor. Peter Force (1790–1868), publisher, former mayor of Washington D.C. Joseph Gales Jr. (1786–1860), journalist, former mayor of Washington D.C. George Gibson, general in U.S. Army. James S. Gunnell, M.D., physician. Reverend Ralph Randolph Gurley (1797–1872), Minister, Chaplain of the United States House of Representatives for the 21st and 22nd Congresses, and again for the 30th and 31st. George Hadfield (1763–1826), Architect, worked on the design of the U.S. Capitol Building. Benjamin Hallowell, Educator. Colonel Archibald Henderson (1783–1859), Commandant of the Marine Corps, serving from 1820 to 1859, later in Washington Monument Society. William Hewitt, Register of Washington. James Hoban (1758–1831), Irish architect, designed the White House. Benjamin Homans, Chief Clerk of the Navy Department. Rev. Dr. Andrew Hunter, Minister. Henry Hunt, M.D., first health officer of Washington. 
Samuel D. Ingham, 1779 to 1860, Pennsylvania House of Representatives, served as Secretary of Treasury. George E. Ironsides, educator. Andrew Jackson, 1767 to 1845, resident member, 7th President of the United States. Thomas P. Jones, 1774 to 1848, Superintendent and Examiner of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Walter Jones, Congressman, 1745 to 1815, District Attorney and Major General of the District Militia. Robert King, City of Washington D.C., Surveyor. Samuel L. Knapp, 1783 to 1838, Writer, Publisher or Editor. William Lambert, writer, congressional clerk, engrosser of the Bill of Rights, clerk of the Pension Office. Samuel Lane, call, commissioner of public buildings. Benjamin Henry Latrobe, 1764 to 1820, architect, designed the United States Capitol. Rev. James Laurie, minister, first president of the Washington Botanical Society. Edmund Law, unknown. John Law, lawyer, son of Thomas Law. Thomas Law, 1756 to 1834, judge and beneficent magistrate, District of Bihar, India. Benjamin L. Lear, unknown. Tobias Lear, 1762 to 1816, private secretary of George Washington. Richard Bland Lee, 1761 to 1827, judge of the Orphans Court. Robert Little, Reverend, 1762 to 1827, Unitarian minister, founder and pastor, First Unitarian Church in Washington. Joseph Lovell, 1788 to 1836, Surgeon General U.S. Army. Alexander Macomb, American general, 1782 to 1841, General in U.S. Army. Frederick May, M.D., physician. George May, M.D., physician. Rev. William Matthews, minister, founder of St. Vincent's Orphan Asylum. John McClelland, Washington Monument Society. John McLean, 1785 to 1861, served as Postmaster General, Justice U.S. Supreme Court. Alexander McWilliams, M.D., physician, surgeon in Navy. Joseph Mecklen, unknown. Josiah Meigs, 1757 to 1822, Surveyor General of the United States, one of original founders and trustees of Columbian College, now George Washington University. Robert Mills, architect, 1781 to 1855, architect, designed the Washington Monument. Thomas Munro, postmaster. William Nolan, Major U.S. Army, Commissioner of Public Buildings. Reverend Isaac Orr, Minister. Joel R. Poinsett, 1779 to 1851, served as Secretary of War. William Prout, City Hall Erection Committee. Richard Randall, M.D., Physician. Daniel Rapine, 1768 to 1826, Publisher, Second Mayor of Washington, D.C. Isaac Roberto, Surveyor in L'Enfance Corp. John Rogers, naval officer, War of 1812, 1772 to 1838, Commodore U.S. Navy. Richard Rush, 1780 to 1859, Attorney General and Secretary of Treasury, son of Benjamin Rush, who signed Declaration of Independence. Rudolf Schar, educator. William Winston Seaton, 1785 to 1866, publisher, former Mayor of Washington, D.C. Thomas Sewell, M.D., 1786 to 1845, physician. John T. Schaff, M.D., physician. Thomas Sims, M.D., physician. Samuel L. Southard, 1787 to 1842, served as Secretary of the Navy, 10th Governor of New Jersey. Reverend Doctor William Stoughton, 1770 to 1829, Chaplain of the United States Senate, Minister, First President of Columbian College. John Stretch, Director of the Washington Library Company. Call William Tatham, Possessor of Important Scientific Library. Pishy Thompson, Writer, Publisher or Editor. 
William Thornton M.D. (1759–1828), Commissioner of Patents, Physician, Architect, designed the U.S. Capitol. Thomas Tingey (1752–1829), Commodore U.S. Navy, Washington Naval Yard. Nathan Towson (1784–1854), U.S. Army, Major General, Paymaster General. John M. Thomas, M.D., Physician. Buckner Thurston (1764–1845), U.S. Federal Judge. Thomas L. Thurston, Librarian of the Department of State. John Underwood, civilian, unknown. John Peter Van Ness (1770–1846), banker, general of the district militia, former mayor of Washington, D.C. Richard Wallach (1816–1881), former mayor of Washington, D.C., first Republican. Bailey Washington, M.D., American naval officer. Tobias Watkins, M.D., physician. George Waterston (1783–1854), writer, librarian of the Library of Congress, a member of the city councils and trustee of the public schools. Roger C. Whiteman (1787–1876), former mayor of Washington D.C. Charles Wilkes (1798–1877), American naval officer and explorer. Timothy Wynne, one of the incorporators of the Navy Yard Bridge Company. William Wirt, Attorney General (1772–1834), author, served as Attorney General. Nicholas Worthington, M.D., physician.